Yeah. 
just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else this morning. Good. Good. Well, it's, we're, we're happy to be here this morning. Uh, something that's on my heart. Um, just earlier this week, you know, reading in um, 2 Samuel 6 about uh, David bringing the ark back into the into the city from Obed-Edom's house. And, uh, you know, y'all all know the story came in you know, every six steps he stopped and, you know, made an offering to the Lord and a sacrifice. And I mean, I could only imagine how long and drawn that out, drawn out that was. But, um, you know, he came in wearing a, a priestly robe and, you know, he gets back home and uh, Mich- Michelle or Michelle, I don't know how to say her name, but, um, you know, she kind of, she kind of rebukes him. You know, she doesn't have some very nice things to say and I won't, I won't go through my uh, my thoughts on it, uh, but I, as I was reading it, I was going, I was having the conversation in my head as though the, I don't know, how many of y'all seen the Californians on Saturday Night Live, just the way they talk? Yeah, anyway, that's how that conversation was going, so it was kind of super funny. Anyway, if you don't know what that is, you look it up, but anyway, the point of it is, uh, you know, David, David, obviously we know David knew some things that we didn't. David was a king, but as he's bringing the ark back into the, into the city, he put on a priestly tunic because he knew that the highest calling was not to be king, but it was to be a priest before him. And so that's how David came into the city as a priest, right? And his wife rebukes him because she thinks he demoted himself to being a priest and he's the king and he's supposed to be highly esteemed but he said no I'm a priest before the Lord that's who I am that's who I've been since I was a little kid right and so obviously she becomes barren and I'm not creating a theology about that that if you judge someone's worship you're going to be barren but I am saying that the Lord holds you know he holds worship precious he, it's precious to him right David's full expression. And so I also think this morning, um, you know, the Lord, the, David danced crazy before the Lord, right? He danced crazy. There's an inward expression of worship and there's an external expression of worship. We were talking about it before. I can't put a percentage on it, right? Some people are just by nature, they just want to dance and go crazy. Other people are very, they're just, they're quiet and they want to worship. The Lord looks at the heart. But worship always looks different. Sometimes it looks like David. Sometimes it looks like Hannah. Right? But the Lord looks at the heart. But there's always an external expression. And we just felt like the Lord was going to release this morning freedom. Maybe internally. Maybe internally. But, but definitely external. Right? An external expression of what's going on inside. It's not a, it's not a thing to just do. Right? You don't just do it to do it. It's an, it's an, it's an expression um, of that. And so, anyway, 
Lord, we love you this morning. We love you. We bless your name this morning, Father. We set our eyes upon you with humble hearts, God, in fear and reverence of who you are and your greatness, Lord. And we bless you, God.
Is moving on the waters. Who is holding out the mountains? Who is peeling back the darkness? The burning light of noon. Who is standing on the mountains? Who is on the earth below? Bigger than the heavens, there is nothing I am so. Creator God, He is Yahweh. Great I am, He is Yahweh. makes me happy Jesus you who is he that gives me peace who is he that brings me comfort turns the bitter into sweet honey on our lips Lord who is stirring up my passion who is rising up in me Filling up my hunger with everything I need. Creator God, Creator God, He is Yahweh. Great I am, He is Yahweh, Lord of all. Rose of Sharon, Rose of Sharon.
us, Lord. He that makes me happy, make a joyful noise. Who is he that gives me peace? Yes, God. Who is he that brings me comfort and turns the bitter into sweet? Who's stirring up my passion? Rising up in me, Jesus. It's filling up my hunger with everything I need. Who is He? Who is He that makes me happy? Who is He that gives me peace? God keeps 
Lord, as we continue to see the Lord, as, as Porter and Missy sing Isaiah 6, I pray you touch the lips with the coal of each and every one of us as we see the Lord. 
do a new work in our lives, I pray. So just collectively in the house and online, as you see the Lord, God, I pray you send the angel with the coal to touch our lips, which we know is the blood of Jesus. Make us new this morning. Cleanse us. Be glorified in our lives. We love you, Lord. Take the cold, touch our lips. Take us deeper in you. Purify us as your bride. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. Be glorified. Be glorified. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. pray you do a new thing in our lives as we see you high and lifted up be pleased made manifest like never before in Jesus name amen amen thank you Lord you may transition or totally stay where you're at if the Lord's touching you this precious young lady here Look, just stay before the presence of the Lord. You're totally fine. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Jesus, for this amazing woman of God. Such purity upon your life. He loves you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Brand new day. Even as you took your um, shoes off, you're on holy ground. And the Lord's taking you from the old into the new. The old into the new. He loves you. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And you're more than welcome to stay there. <laughs> Don't feel like you got to go anywhere. In Jesus' good. Come on. That was so um, rich. Got my foot tapping again. <laughs> um, so. Everybody doing good? <clears throat> um, really excited, man, to jump into the word. Laura, what's up? Beautiful, uh, <laughs> beautiful young one. Um, so, everybody have a good week. So, so. Mary John's always the one. <clears throat> Look, when you're top Bassett seller in the globe, you're having a good week. <laughs> But um, I'll tell you what, I kind of want to go on the floor. Is that cool? I uh, may not matter, but I, I was remembering I saw it. I kept seeing myself on the floor. I don't know why this morning. Maybe I'm missing our academy. Uh, so I'll talk to you from the floor. Is that okay, balcony? You got TVs. Is that cool? <laughs> and we normally stay up here for you all, but um, look, Benjamin's loving me on the floor. He's all for it. Um. There we go. I don't know why. I just skipped seeing myself down here. So just see what happens. Uh, I remember one, one story with William Branham, <coughs> amazing man of God. He, some people said some things towards the end, but a lot of them aren't even that accurate. But anyway, that's beside the point. But an amazing man of God, incredible fruit. One time he, uh, well, many times, but he would go into prayer <coughs> and see how the vision would play out. And, uh, and just function in that way. He would do only what he saw the Father doing. Sorry. I got it. Yeah. Um, and so he would see the way it would play out like praying for the sick. 
things like this. How many of you know the Lord moves in different ways very often? Sometimes it's putting mud in somebody's eyes. Sometimes it's go jump in the pool of Salome. I mean, there's just different ways. You don't want to get set in that way. And um, I'll never forget, my mom will remember this story. I didn't know I was going to go here. But I was in prayer one morning, still in Baton Rouge. Porter will remember where this is at. And I'm at my house, but I go into a vision where I'm over on Essen Lane uh, by this hospital, the major hospital in Baton Rouge, Our Lady of the Lake, I think. And I'm praying for this man, but I'm this older man or something, but I'm praying for his ankles. Some of you have heard this story. And I was like, that was strange. Very real, though. You guys get it. When you're in prayer, just, it was very real. That's all I knew. I came out of it, went about my day, kind of forgot about it. And I happened to be over on that side of town. My mom messages me. She's like, look, she's an evangelist. She doesn't know she is, but she just loves people. And she just gets all up in. And before you know it, she's like winning people to the Lord and telling them, you got to watch and this, that, and the other. And just hungry for Jesus. And so, uh, but one of her friend's dads, older man, was in the hospital I forget what it was. Something with the throat, though. Throat cancer, if that's such a thing. Like, like uh, oh, y'all are like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Get a clue, Brian. <laughs> um, uh, so, so we go there, and this is all the Lord. I didn't even know. I, was, I wasn't thinking about, but just, I don't know. Sometimes I just kept seeing myself down here. You just follow the Lord and see where it goes. So, uh, yep, she, she goes, he's actually in us, and, you know, Our Lady of the Lake. I said, no way. Ah, this is that vision. You know, you do only what you see the Father doing. And Jesus would do that. He'd go on prayer, see things, and, and walk them out. And the better you can align your life to that, being spirit-led, and things just happen. And so I go in there, and uh, all the nonsense is up around the throat, the machines, the whatever, packaging, all that stuff. And I knew they didn't know what I was doing. I was like, sure, I'd love to pray. And I go down to his ankles. <laughs> I'm kidding. I was like, Jesus, I'm holding his ankles. That's how salt and prayer, I don't know to this day. We'll get to heaven one day, and, and I don't know why. And um, anyway, he was totally healed. My mom will um, t- tell you it was like a miraculous thing. And yeah, <laughs> praise God. And then um, I think he went on and just passed of old age. Yeah, he was old when I got in there. But I mean, you know, the Lord doesn't care. He's, you know, so it was so good. But um, quick tithe and offering, um, a couple of announcements. And uh, babe, let me give you, I forgot my car keys in my pocket. And um, we'll jump in the word together. I'm really excited. I pray he touches us this morning. Um, you know, just love him, his word. And at least for me, it was blessing me with what I've been getting into in, in scripture. And so I appreciate it, man. Um, but let me read to you out of Haggai uh, 1.9. I've quoted this before just in regards to giving and living a generous life and letting the Lord take it from there. Bianca, listen, we had that chocolate. Yeah, yeah. was it from Finland? Yeah. Listen, she, so it weren't Bianca, one of our amazing students from Finland, but also Texas. She's like a hybrid. She, uh, <laughs> deep well in the Holy Ghost too. And so anyway, she, uh, I think brought it back. She's recently went to Finland, brought some chocolate. She told me and Zoe after class one night, she said, hey, listen, don't throw this in the refrigerator. This isn't your typical Hershey's. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I was like, huh, I don't, I don't really normally throw stuff in the fridge, but I'm sure people do. I don't know enough about it. And uh, so especially we're starting, that's one of the announcements of Fast Tomorrow. You got you to gotta go big, you know, get yourself into some chocolates and stuff like that. And so, <laughs> but so we had it. She says she, when she moved to the state, she was like, look, everybody's talking about all this Hershey and stuff and this big hype. And she had it. She was like, Ooh, you know, and when you taste their chocolate, you know why we have been robbed <laughs> in the U S man. I'm telling you it's, it's heavenly. It's like, I don't know what the milks, the cows are doing over there or what, but it's ultra creamy. It's like, I looked at Judah. I said, wow. He goes, really? I said, oh, yeah, wait. <laughs> Break you off a square, son. <laughs> and sure enough, he looked back at me with the same eyes. And then later, Zoe comes down to the bath. She's like, Papa, this, that, and the other, we get some snacks. Okay. I said, babe, look, before you get snacks, there's some chocolate on the island. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, grab a bar, you know. Uh, anyway, she's sitting right here, so I remember, but that was heavenly. So um, Haggai chapter 1 to um, just remind us a 
of trying to keep God first in all things with our time spent, our heart loving him. You know, the Lord, God, with all of our heart, mind, strength, which looks like finances often, looks like your time, laying your life down. Just your heart's desire goes back to him in all things. And I love this one. Um, I kind of like the way the New Living reads it a little better, but I'm in the um, New King James. And, uh, and so watch this, Haggai chapter 1. Uh, we'll start in verse 3. It says, Then the word of the Lord came uh, by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourself to dwell in your paneled houses in this temple to lie in ruins? Meaning, basically, he's, he's addressing his people that are having tendencies that are leaning upon caring for themselves before God, making sure their houses are nice and tidy and kind of neglecting the things of God. And when we do that, by default, you see lack comes on us. And again, you know my heart. We don't give to get and all this, but it is a biblical principle. And it's so beautiful that God set it up this way in, in that when we keep him first in all things, um, it just causes a by default flow of his kingdom to flow in our lives and this, that, and the other. But I love you see here that the, what cuts off the supply line of abundance is God himself. The devil's nowhere in this chapter. Meaning as soon as we start neglecting God first in any area, of course, I'm taking up tithe and offering or giving you the opportunity to give if you want to and feel led. So it's in that context, but it really applies across the board. And, um, any time we start, and we've all been there and get it, and it just happens sometimes through, through time. If we forget and we start putting ourselves first and we neglect him, his goodness and abundance starts to neglect us. Yeah. And it's like, it's not because he loves us conditionally either. He loves us. It's just a principle. His kingdom It's just awesome. And so it's like, oh, yeah, Lord, help me make sure I, I just sow all I can of my life, finances, whatever, into you first. And then the blessing comes by default anyway, that I can then glorify you better from that state anyway. So watch this. It says, you have so much and bring in little in regards to like your fields. You've worked it, toiled. No, uh, where is, is Brandy Bell here this morning? Nursing. She's in the nursery. Oh, amazing. Serving in the back. Listen, that's another student of ours. She's incredible. She has a garden apparently because we got one of the watermelons. When I mentioned that watermelon thing that morning, week later you have not because you ask not <laughs> i'm teasing it came up by accident but so i don't know a week later so she brings one of her kind of first fruits one of the first watermelons is it watermelons is that right you can say it plural uh, from her garden this thing was the biggest watermelon i've ever seen on the planet like judah's out in the foyer trying to hold it and uh delicious incredible glory melon but, you know, you work whatever it is in life and all of a sudden nothing's coming out of the vine. Nothing's, you, you, you work and toil and nothing's coming back. God says, basically, you eat, don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. And who earns, he who earns wages, earns wages to put them in holes, bags with holes. Have you ever been there in life? Like, man, I'm grinding, I'm trying and everything I get, it's like it just slips through the hole in a bag and it just never, when God's kingdom, I think Luke 6 he gives back. Remember, press down, shaking together, running over. Amen. He never is into the arena of holes in our bags with depletion and, and, and less than before. But that, you can see in Scripture, will certainly set in if we start to neglect him first. I mean, in the slightest way. I just don't ever even want to toe the line. You know, I want to go big the other way. And by default, so it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, exclamation mark, verse 7. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I might take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I, I blew it away. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. You can bind the devil all you want, but when God's blowing something away, <laughs> it's going away. You know, and it really, it just, this is what happens by default. He doesn't love you any less. It's just we're getting out of a line with the perfect kingdom way. And so, um, and if you read further, this is where it kicks into, he, he reverses, they, they heat it and start to focus on God's house, providing, taking care for the things of God, sowing into God first, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, all things will be added. It's first him. 
Uh, and then you see as the progression goes through Haggai, he blesses them. And this is where he starts to say, silver and gold are mine. I'll shake the nations and bring them to you. He can shift it in a moment if our heart will be right. And so, um, you know, just a healthy reminder that in all things, help me, Lord, get better. You know, get better at just um, not only in the financial arena, but all, all areas of life. And I want to bless you with that. So um, ways to give online and in person. Um, QR code, checks payable to Ascend Church. On checks, if you write out a million dollars, six zeros. <laughs> I'm totally teasing. <laughs> hey, Shereen says, she, you are serious. <laughs> I'll receive that. Because sometimes the zeros, you can get confused and make it just 100,000. It's just one extra zero. And that'll be good. Put the commas where they need to go. <laughs> Shereen said, M-I-L-L-I-O-N. <laughs> That's awesome. But um, you can give online and obviously in person. We, you should have envelopes. And, and we'll, um, you can, in a second, we'll, I will pray. But if you could let each other out of the aisles, we have baskets up front you can give. Oh, yeah, also, I keep forgetting. I really mean to, and then I forget. I get up in here and anointing and word and, and probably just me forgetting probably 90% of it. <laughs> but um, do we have any guests here this morning? You can raise your hand. Hey, oh, what's up? What's up, my man? How are you? Raise your hand. Hi, in the balcony as well. Awesome. If you could welcome them. Um, bro, did you go to St. Louis yet? You came back already? Okay, so are you back for a little bit or you got to go back? Nice. Good seeing you, man. How was it? We'll get, we're just getting a conversation in front of everybody. But that's a solid man of God. He loves Jesus. He lives in the area. And we got to meet him and his buddy. Um, anyway, we'd love to bless you guys with stuff in the store. Anything you want on the way out, just snag it. We have coffee mugs. It's fun. Um, books, shirts, things like this. Just grab what you can. It'll be awesome. If you want to get something for somebody, a friend, bless them. And honored to have you guys with us. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your uh, presence. We love you. You're everything to us. God, thank you for the worship this morning. Incredible worship team, the river that flowed. Be glorified, God. Thank you for you. I pray even this morning you anoint your word and change us together. Take us deeper in um, you and deeper together in love for your glory. And I pray right now um, for the family in the house and across the world online, the blessing of God come upon you. Just like Haggai says, God says, the silver and gold are mine. I'll shake the nations and bring them to you. The glory of this temple will be greater than that of the, the former. I pray the blessing of God upon your house, everything you put your hands to, that you may love him more and give him glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. We'll play an Academy video, and then you guys want to let people out of the aisles, you can come give while we play that. And it's been incredible, honestly, has exceeded my expectations, what the Lord has been doing in transforming lives. Um, I'm just so impacted and grateful in, in watching what the Lord's doing trimester after trimester, year after year with the students. And it's such a platform where we're yielding unto the Lord, where He says, look, go and make disciples of all nations. Disciples are learner, a learned one from the Lord. And so we're all diving in together, following the Lord on this journey, going deep into Scripture, deep into His manifest presence. love to have you guys. Maybe next week we'll get some students up here and testify what the Lord's been doing. So we're two weeks out. Those of you may be here or online watching that want to join. 
and we're going to hit the ground running, so excited, expectant. Hey, police officer back there. Oh, I wish I knew his name. How are you? It, <laughs> so grateful for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew his name. <laughs> so cool, man. Got in the glory for a second. But um, would encourage you to jump in this trimester to catch the 2024 graduation class. And um, look, man, it's going to be incredible. The, the Lord's been just blowing our minds. Love to have you. And that'll be good. Oh, yeah. Also, last announcement. Um, we start a fast tomorrow should you want to join us. I think they have. Yeah. Um, Seven-day fast. Everybody's like, yay. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, and technically, somebody called us on it, and it was, it, they're right. It's about a six-and-a-half-day fast. But when you say seven, it just sounds cool. I mean, it just sounds complete, full. If you want to get technical, you can start the half a day. You can start today. Yeah, 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 start tonight. But I'm starting tomorrow morning. <laughs> just, 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 you know, I'm doing the six and a half. <laughs> uh, but, and we're going to break it together. And however you feel led, you know, some people do water only, liquids, Daniel, vegetables. Some people fast things that just kind of have a hook in them. And it's good to just set apart and detach for seasons, see what the Lord would do. And the next Sunday, um, promise I'll preach quick and uh, we'll be here. A lot of our amazing family, bring whatever you want, food, desserts. It'll be a lot of fun. Just get to hang out, chat together, be here a good bit of the afternoon and eat together. So that'll be good. Okay. So um, if you want to turn to, I'm gonna, it's going to be a minute till I get there, but John 21 Uh, I'm going to pick back up from where we've been. Hopefully it blesses you guys and just changes us, uh, myself included. So <clears throat> if you've been following us for maybe the past few weeks, you guys can see me in the balcony. We're good. Thumbs down. Thumbs up. You got the TVs. Okay. You look beautiful and handsome. But the past few weeks, um, it kind of started in, it's really been a series, I guess. It wasn't really intended, it just happened that way. But I started, if you've been following us, in Genesis 15, where Abram, he's trying to kind of step out into the things of God, you know, excess, inheritance, this, that, and the other. Gets into dialogue with God. He says, well, the Lord says, fear not, Abram. I am your exceedingly great reward. And that right there, you can camp your whole life out on. That's the prize of life, him. And, and please always know when I touch on promises and inheritance, it's really with that at the foundation, him. Uh, but sometimes we can get top heavy in inheritance only, and, sorry, in him only, and not walking in the inheritance, and that also doesn't give him full glory. So you can kind of go in either ditch, and we just want to be full. Jesus did it beautifully. He even got to the point where he's sweating sweat drops of blood and asking, flawless Lamb of God, could this cup pass? He's like, no, the inheritance, though, that's going to come through me dying and rising again. No, nope. I'll drink it. You see, so sometimes the obedient part, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's hard, it's costly. That right there, stepping into it, the fullness, gives God glory while we love him as well. And he's our exceedingly great reward. So Abram's like, hey, sounds like a good plan, God, but how's that going to work out practically? God says, I'm glad you asked. Look at my son. Everything's there. So, you know, we went through it. He, he says, uh, give me a three-year-old heifer, three-year-old female goat, um, ram, turtle dove pigeon. I believe, beautiful depiction of the Lord, what all he's done is full sacrifice. Before Abram even started the race, he's at the starting line. Gun hadn't even gone off. And God's like, my son, I'll see it all. Your mistakes, your yieldedness. The offspring birth from your yieldedness, I'll multiply and bless it. It's all in him. It's all in him. Always. Always has been. Always will be. 
and uh, so so that that first week we we kind of springboarded from third John chapter one in regards to inheritance and uh, talking about you know where he says I would that you I pray that you may um, prosper in all things be in good health uh, even as your soul prospers and we touched on um, prospering in all things being in good health and so I want to touch this morning on as, even as our soul prospers it's super um, yeah thank you Kristen she knows thank you so much um, see if we go to yellow or blue no nope. no wonder no Kleenex wonders this morning And so it's super important. How many of you know it's super important that we also, like I love that John, nearest to the Lord, um, prayed this, that you may prosper in all things, be in good health. We touched on that last week. And again, so sorry if I touched, stepped on toes. That was never my heart's intent. And don't claim to have perfect theology by any means. We're trying to go better, better here. Even as your soul prospers. So how many of you know it's super vital that our soul prospers? You know, you can be gifted, walk in the anointing, power and all this, but if your soul is off somewhere, it can really bring about repercussions. It can, there can be problems that constantly pop up. And I believe in this last hour, he's raising up a bride that really, I, I pray above all, this one's a big one to me, that, that her soul would prosper above all. You know, and even prospering in all things attaches it, but it's, it also, it's all things. But our soul is super important that we walk uh, in complete wholeness in our soul, which the Lord, again, it's all in him. He's done. He's done it. He's paid it in full. Wouldn't it be kind of a sad story if the Lord had paid mostly in full? That would mean biblically there'd be a right for certain areas of our life to be them to be uh, schisms and, and uh, hangups in our soul or problems. And life presents them. Persecution, you're not going to get around. The righteous, your inheritance in life, at some point in time, you will be persecuted. So those are great. But the things I'm talking about, the Lord paid for us to be full. And he says, you know, he prayed, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This is a great way to look at it. When Jesus stepped on the scene, he says, you know, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. What's up, Isaiah? How are you doing, man? Not out of hand out of reach we can still be near but at hand within grasp the kingdom of heaven and guess what's in the kingdom of heaven complete soul complete healing prospering in all things it's the full reign of the Lord and so um, I love John 21 because it's a beautiful picture we all a lot of us know this account where the Lord comes back in that in between stage of resurrected but not yet ascended to restore Peter and it's deep in his soul how many of you had like deep soul wounds. If you're not raising your hand, you are lying. You've got wounds because you just lied. No, I'm just <laughs> I'm your soul is not prospering. I'm totally teasing, but you know, just life, it, it happens, you know. And uh, what I love about the Lord is he's so perfect and true. His sacrifice is so full and complete. If we will just listen to the father he says, oh, you, I'm glad you asked. Look at my son. Look at him, stay close to him, abide in him. Um, we can walk in a, in a wholeness. He can fix anything too, but you don't understand what happened. It, there is no mountain big enough that can compete against the blood of Jesus. The work that he's done, it's all powerful. Literally in every arena, every arena he's done it all. He literally hung there. It is finished. Gave up the ghost and it was done forever for all of time. Now it's just our part. You guys know I've been talking about with the renewal of the mind driving away the vultures. It's just a beautiful depiction of the old covenant into the new to walk in the fullness of what he's paid for. And so here in this account, um, Peter, you know, we all know he, um, it's, it's kind of commonly understood. It doesn't explicitly say in scripture, but a lot of people believe what the Lord came to do is restore the denial of three times with, do you love me three times? A lot of us see that. And I believe you could pull that, go into other revelations as well, and they'd be good. But I love here that um, kind of the story we're coming into is literally a couple chapters before Last Supper 
Jesus, we all know, eating with them. He already says, Judas, go and do what's in your heart. Gave him bread, so Satan entered him. Judas is gone. And then he starts talking about how he'll, he'll basically suffer death in, I believe, a parabolic way. And Peter goes, oh, no, he quotes the Old Testament passage. That's what it was. They'll strike the shepherd. All of you will flee. Basically foretells that they'll all abandon him. And here comes Peter, man. Amazing, but quick to speak up often. Thought a little more highly than himself at this point in time. And the Lord has a way of breaking those type people, but still using them powerfully. It's just awesome. He's so beautiful, complete, and true. Peter says, um, oh, no, not me, Lord. And he, he set himself apart like they might. You're probably right about them, but me? Not a chance. Boldly. They just had the Last Supper. He's feeling right. He says, even if you are to die, I'll die with you. I felt like the Lord wasn't even going to say anything, but since he piped up, Look, the Lord has a way with dealing with pride. In love, he loves you, but he has a way. He can, he can pull the rug out real well because he, he knows it's a, um, it's a divisive wall there. You, he can't work with pride. He can't work. He's got to keep breaking that vessel that's, that's warped. You've got to stay pliable. And uh, So the Lord says, oh, oh you think so? Hmm. Before the rooster crows, before this night's up, you'll deny me three times. Peter's thinking, we'll see, you know. And we all know the, the story goes on. They come, arrest Jesus, take him into the courtyard, all this. John, it says, because he knew the high priest, he got in. He had a way in, and then he, he kind of spoke to get Peter in, which that's still saying something. Everybody else fled. They didn't go that deep with him. Peter goes in. I love Luke. Peter's denials in all four Gospels, none of them left that out. A lot of them pick and choose, but that was a major. Matthew 10, listen, 33, I think. Jesus told them all, he says, if you deny me before men, I promise you. It's not that I don't love you. I just, I'm telling you right now, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. That's a big, big deal. You deny, and I want to encourage you guys with where the days are heading. Didn't mean to go here. But we've got to be so deeply rooted in him, so brainwashed in the love of God, burning that whatever comes our way, we don't deny, we don't come off of anything, like not a chance. I teach my kids this way. The face of martyrdom, bring it. I'll get to my bride, groom sooner. Sorry, it's a little heavy for some, but we just, you don't come off of anything. The word, the Lord, no, not a chance. To Peter's defense, this is pre-Holy Ghost. You know, they've been with him three years, this, that, and the other. But you got to remember what Peter's dealing with here before this kind of healing of the soul happens. And, uh, Matthew 10, if you deny me before men. So they go in there, courtyard. Uh, Jesus is arrested. Peter gets in. He's trying to hang out undercover. They even start a fire to warm themselves. It says Peter warms himself by the fire. So this looks like the state where we're still, we care more about us, our life, saving our life that we may not lose it, but that's backwards for the kingdom. You must lose it to gain it for the kingdom. And so Peter started this hang up in his soul about putting himself first because somebody asked him, aren't you, didn't you run with the Lord? He's like, oh no. Because to say that puts him at risk to get locked up and lose his life too. So see, he's still hanging on to his life. He denied him once. Another person asked, denied twice. Third time. Because he's not wanting to lose his life now. He's wanting to save his life. And the third time, the rooster crows or whatever. And um, is that what it is? Crows? I couldn't remember. And, and I love Luke. Uh, Luke, I think 22, somewhere in there, it says Jesus looked at him. Can you imagine? This is what Peter's dealing with now, fast-forwarding a few chapters to fishing in John 21. They crow twice, and, and none of the other gospels say this. Luke's gospel goes into the detail and say the Lord just looked at him. I told you. I told you. But I'll still build my church on you. He sees through it all. He sees through it all. He's so perfect and true. And so uh, the Bible says, I'm just sorry when I start talking about the Lord and seeing him. I just get wrecked. And thinking about his nature and everything, you know. Uh, so the, the Bible says Peter went outside. Matthew, Mark, and Luke mentioned this. John doesn't because he wasn't out there. He stayed in. 
near the Lord. The nearer we can stay in, the less soulish issues you have because you're so in him. You, off offenses, rejections, you don't know what they are. You don't care. You've got him. You've got the perfect sacrifice. Say what you want about me. It, it gets easier to go through. The, they don't stop, but they become like water off of a duck's back because you're so near him. And you're so complete and full in him. You don't care. And that's where John's at. But all the other gospels, since they rejected or are on the outside of the courtyard, it says Peter ran. He remembered what Jesus said when he looked at him, went outside and wept bitterly. This is where the soul wound happens. Boom. And these, these, these chasms happen in the soul. They, 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 they form where we're not prospering in our soul. These hurts, these wounds, they happen from people. They happen from our own rejections, whatever it may be. And all the gospels mention that. And so the Lord goes on, dies, rises again, appears two times before this account, but this was the third time. But mind you, Peter, so I'm trying to build up to this point. Sorry, it's taking so long. So Peter's dealing with this and you can see it in the word, but it's nothing the Lord can't fix. We've just got to go to the full sacrifice. Abram, look at my son. And we spend too much time going everywhere else other than him. And he forms such a complete people. So verse one, John 21, here we are. It says, um, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And look, I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit comes through by the word and the anointing and like resets souls. Amen. He can do it. Londa, what's up? Miss you. He can do it in a heartbeat. I remember one time I was um, hurt deeply and I was in the right. <laughs> Not, you know, when there's those things, you always think you're in the right. But I really was this time. I'm serious. <laughs> Meaning I was just to be hurt. It seemed just, it was right, you know, and, and these people, again, uh, it, it was deception that formed the thing anyway in the first place and all this. But I mean, this was a for real one. You know, I've been through many and they don't stop just so you know, they, don't, they actually increase. The more you step on the front lines and just kingdom stuff, oh yeah, the, the volume just increases. But that's why you got to stay into the full sacrifice. You're like, yep, yep, yep. Jesus is amazing. John, you, you don't find yourself outside of the courtyard away from the Lord weeping. You're just, Jesus is amazing. Jesus is amazing. And they were all, Jesus is amazing. Jesus, my perfect sacrifice. Whole soul, blessed, prospering in the soul. Uh, but, and I was learning this back then too. Probably wasn't as close as I needed to be, but I mean, it was a deep one. I mean, stabbed in the back, full blown. So I found myself, I couldn't shake it. You ever been there where something hits you at such a deep soul level, you just can't shake it. You quote the verses, you put the magnets on the refrigerator and look at them, you know, they don't, it doesn't work. So I'm reading the Bible, not working. I can't even focus on the Bible. I'm just, and every time this, these people where it happened from would pop up, I could feel this thing stir up. It, what, it, was, it wasn't fixed. That's not on the Lord's end. He's paid it all. We just got to go on him. So literally this time, they don't always look this way. But I said, I can't, I, this, this can't be. And so I locked up. Some of you have heard this account and just prayed in tongues nonstop. I, wasn't, I was like, I'm not coming off of this. It was hours, some of us four or five something, just staying at it. And all of a sudden, I got so deep in him, the perfect sacrifice, the presence. My spirit got so strong. The Bible says praying in the spirit edifies your spirit, man, praying in unknown tongues. And so the realm of the soul, its voice starts to get real small to the point where it goes mute and silent and invalid, non-significant. The voice of the spirit trumps. And all of a sudden, something clicked in place in God and it supernaturally not only broke, but a love from God, trust me, in me, this would not have happened. It came on me for the people. I could feel it. Not only did I not care, all the, the wounds were gone instantly. The stabbing in the back, so I'm doing that. And, and all that, I didn't care, I could care less. But also supernaturally deposited was love for the people. So I actually knew them well enough to, to um, send these gifts the ones they love the most to, you know, and sent gifts, never heard back to this day, probably just mocked me or whatever. You know, what are you trying to, I don't care because I'm free now. You know what I mean? Full of the Lord. Yeah. And, uh, and so, and there's many more and you all could share similar stories, but they just happen in life. And the more we can lock into the Lord, and this is one that happened to Peter by his own rejection of the Lord. Sometimes it happens, rejects people rejecting you offenses, all these things start to happen in the soul. And uh, so watch this. 
Uh, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. I love that right there. You could sit there forever. And in, in this way, he showed himself. He, anyway, I'll get hung up there. But the Lord shows himself in certain ways for different purposes. Um, verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin. Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee. Most scholars believe that's Bartholomew and Nathaniel, same person. Sons of Zebedee, that's James and John. They were fishermen as well. Peter, fishermen. These guys were elite fishermen. This is what they knew. This is what they did. Um, and two others of, others of his disciples were together. We don't know. Maybe Matthew, Mark, maybe Philip. Uh, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Uh, I want to stop there for a second. So again, we're now, we have Peter in this state where he's carrying this thing. He literally three times denied the Lord. The Lord looked at him and said, you know, he went out, wept bitterly, and there's been no fixing since. So he's carrying this thing. The Lord's gone. All of what they knew and thought they were giving their life to is like not before them. And so they're all out here. Jesus has not really ascended yet. Um, Pentecost has not happened, but it's right around the corner. And this is also a beautiful picture into a person's life of how quickly the Lord can flip it around for his glory fast. By his, his death and resurrection, he can do it. It doesn't have to be some long, I hear of these, there's just some interesting um, takes and ideologies on like inner healing. The Lord can do it in a moment, I'm telling you. You don't have to dig out into the past and do all this stuff. The Lord, it's not really in here. It's not in the word. I get some of it, but some of it just, it keeps popping up and causing these interesting circles. And it's all in him. It's been done. So, um, so Peter's like, they're hanging out. He said, I'm going fishing. And if you read in there, it says they all were like, I'm, we're going too. Seven of them, seven disciples. Peter had this leadership thing on him. He would speak up first. He had that. Everybody's like, okay, Peter's going there. You could you can just see it in the word. They followed him. He just kind of had that prominent, I believe, demeanor about him, which is God. It's beautiful. God knew it. That's why he's like, I'm building my church on him. Sometimes that's a good thing. It's just we need a whole soul in it. Whereas J John, not so much. He wasn't quick to speak. He was just the nearest to the Lord, though, too. And so also don't be fooled on, there's a side note, on just who's prominent and used in powerful ways to think they're closer to the Lord. Don't ever think that. They're doing what they're called, but when you get to heaven and watch John's mansion, you'd be like, oh, I didn't know that. You know, he was nearest. And so it's really about the call and loving and obeying him well. So he says, I'm going fishing. And uh, what I believe this can speak of amidst so many other things is what happens in life, especially when soul wounds and things set in, and then also we're in an interim stages of life. This happens often. Meaning, remember, what did God call them out of? Fishing. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. That's the very place he calls them out of. This is what they knew. This was their, like, identity. But then this happens. Jesus is gone. And so basically what the Lord's often trying to do is take us from glory to glory in our call. And I think often our older identity, even in God and chapters in life, Sometimes he'll move us to an interim stage where he has not ascended, so to speak. We haven't ascended with him and gone on to Pentecost in the next chapter. And in that interim stage, it's super vital that we be patient and wait and hear God. Because if we're not careful, our natural default can be go, to go back to the old chapter. Go back to the old identity, what we knew, where we feel secure, where we feel important, what we know. Is this making sense to you guys? Is this what Peter is doing? He's like... I'm going fishing. This is what I know. I feel distraught. I'm not going to say it, but I'm hurting my soul. The Lord's not here. I can't see where the next chapter is. I can't see it. So I'm going to go back to what I know, what I'm familiar with, where I feel important. Important. I'm tired of being in this interim stage where people ask me, what are you doing? And I, I hate to have to say I don't really know. A lot of it's pride if we're honest. I want to be able to tell them what I'm doing and what God's doing through me and this, that, and the other. And he knows fishing. He's like Bass Pro Tournament elite. Peter, John, all of them, really. They were like cream of the crop fishermen. So he's like, I'm going back to this. I can make money. He's going back to what the Lord called him out of. He's reverting back to it. And this is where soulless wounds, if they stay, they'll, they'll keep wanting to pull you. They pull you back to old hurts that you can't progress with them. You can't take them into the promise and they, they won't let you in. 
And so I saw the Lord makes a, a point and a purpose to come back into your life. He's so loving. Even though you denied him, he doesn't care. He's going to fix it. And, um, but that going fishing right there is so huge because it speaks of, like I said, I'm going back to what I know where I can feel important again and do something I'm certain of. People can see me and think I'm doing stuff and we revert back and, but we, we don't hear God in it. And if we're not careful, others will follow us. And so all seven are on a boat now. And, uh, yeah, they said to him, um, verse three, they said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But went verse four, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know who, uh, that it was Jesus. Verse 5, then Jesus said to them, children, have you, uh, have you any food? They answered him, no. So I want to stop right there. This is another uh, issue that happens when our soul is not whole. Not only is this just constant pulling back, it's hard to progress and move past it. And we want to avert, we, we don't handle interim stages real well. We want to become comfortable with those. It's the whole people left Egypt and now you're in a wilderness going to the promised land. It's like, no, I got to go back. Leeks and garlics. I got to go to what I know. I, it pulls you back. And the Lord tries to come into those stages and keep pulling you forward. And how we choose there is super important. But one thing you can see here is they're out on the boat now. Let's call it Chris is where the Lord is. If you, if you read later, it's only 200 cubits, about a football field away, not far at all. The Bible says Jesus stood on the shore and they didn't even know it was him. They couldn't see him, that it was him. Football field away. And even calls to them, children, do you have any food? They still didn't know it was him. So what happens is also in soulish wounds, if you will, are there our souls not complete. We make decisions that aren't, aren't healthy. We revert back to things we don't know, but also our ability to see and hear the Lord gets obscure. The reality of where he's at and what he's doing. So there's just so much here. Also, you better believe, again, disciples are on the boat. Whenever the Lord appears and he's on a different real estate, you're in the wrong place. You chose wrong. He still loves you. He's going to work a miracle even in that to get you back. But if he ever, see, before this, remember, he showed up through the walls. He showed up where they were at. But in this decision, I'm going fishing, big no-no. They chose wrong. Peter kicks the whole thing off from just, I believe, so much more but a hurt state. And that's why the Lord's like, I'm not going to show up. He could have appeared in the boat. But he's like, no, you guys are going back to what I called you out of. So when you ever hear the Lord and finally see him and recognize and he's, he's on land and you're at sea, you chose wrongly. You're in the wrong place. Does that make sense? And a soul, a, not a whole soul is what causes these things. But he says, children, have you any food? Um, that word children there is immature, half grown. He's kind of talking down to them. Number one, do you think Jesus was really wondering if they had food or not? He knew. You know, he knows all things. He's asking them for them sake. Like in other words, don't ever forget this window where y'all chose, y'all chose to go back. I need to build my church upon you. And you chose to go back. And I'm going to always remember this dialogue we had before you even knew it was me talking to you from the beach. Do you have any food? And they had to answer, no, we've been fishing all night. Bass, pro, tournament winners. Can't, using all the baits. Can't catch a thing. I believe he's, you know, reminding them, like, look, apart from me, you can do nothing. Don't ever forget that. And he calls them children, which is like an immature, young, um, even means a damsel, like an unmarried, just young. Like immature decision you're making, this, set and the other. They answered him, no. He said to them, cast net on the right side. We all know this. Passage. They drew in the multitudes. Therefore, I love this, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. <laughs> Exclamation mark. And guess who re finally realized it was the Lord first, John? Whoever's always, this is always the case, whoever's most intimately equated with the Lord, they always recognize him first. He had to tell Peter, still didn't know. But the miracle, and then he probably recognized the tone of voice, he goes, oh, it's the Lord, Peter, it's him.
Uh, now, when Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. I'll stop right there. How many of you, when you jump in the ocean or the pool, you'd make sure to put on your outer garment? <laughs> <laughs> Unheard of. But like knee-jerk reaction. He's like, it's the Lord. He throws on his, his outer garment and then jumps in the ocean. It's just so backwards. But what I believe this speaks of is when we're dealing with those, we just have that knee-jerk reaction to cover up guilt, shame. Uh, it's the whole Adam and Eve with the figs, fig leaves, sorry. God comes. That when they, you commit something and it, they set in the soul, but what's so good about God is you can can the whole fig leaves in the outer garment. He doesn't care. He sees through it all. He knows it all, and he'll love you through it all. He's so perfect and true, but Peter's like, it's the Lord. He didn't feel free. Normally, you'd leave your outer garment and say, boys, I'm swimming to get there quicker. Bring my garment, keep it dry. But he throws it on. It speaks of the, the, the feeling, and this is what, again, a, a, a not, uh, not a whole soul, the lack of a whole soul, per, it, you keep that on you. It's this guilt, the shame. You feel the need to cover up. And often, even worse yet, we want to go away from the Lord, and that's just detrimental because then you're, that's so where the vultures come in. You know, you, you don't go to the sacrifice. God says, look at my son. Peter chose rightly to swim to the Lord, which also I believe is a picture of baptism. All the other disciples got to the Lord on boat, but Peter goes in the water and pops up on shore to the Lord in newness. And it says that the Lord came in the morning. You know, all this is so much here, but they fished through the night. And uh, the Bible says that Jesus, he wasn't going to visit you in your dark state of choosing wrongly and going back to the old chapter. He won't even do it. He'll wait till the morning and then pop up where you're supposed to be. Remember what he called you out of. He, he'll just keep calling you back to. And in the morning, his mercies are new every morning. It's a new day. The wise virgins in Matthew 25, he comes at midnight, new day. That's all he does. He doesn't know anything else. And he does this with the soul so beautifully, so masterfully. He's always trying to reset and go. He's not trying to dig and go back. He never even mentions in this uh, Peter's denial. He only did that in the moment to correct the pride, but it's just beautiful. And I love how he does it too. You'll see in a second, he's so personal, not trying to shame people and leave negative stigma on people. The, uh, John 4, the woman at the well, remember the disciples weren't even there. He does all this baggage one-on-one. -on -one. He's so intimate, personal, and true. In a second with Peter, you see he does the same thing. But so Peter jumps in, swims um, to the Lord, throws on his outer garment, and, um, oh, yeah, I have a ton of notes. I'm just talking from my heart. But I probably won't really go to my notes, but there's a list of things for the sake of who it may, um, who it may um, bless. You know what's funny? My password, not that you'd care, to my iPad is 29. You know you have six for your iPhone, I, iPad thing? 292929. Deuteronomy 2929. It's the secret things. Um, should I not have given that out? <laughs> it won't matter. <laughs> Uh, look, one time I was preaching in Houston. I'm not kidding. I'm just like super real and down to earth. I don't, I don't think about it. So I was preaching in uh, Houston and uh, dwelling place. I'll be with them later this year. They're amazing. I love them. And so I, I, this crazy revelation happened with this like mystery tied in and all this stuff. And so I'm sharing it and I had this thing on my phone that tied into it. And I'm like, I promise you, you, you got to look. So I walk off the platform, ton of people there. I don't know. It was maybe, I don't know, 800 or something and so or whatever five or, or eight, I don't know. And uh, so I was like, look, no, for real, pass around, I'll get it at the end. And so I give him my phone and, I'm, and it starts passing down the aisle. Later, security, it's Michael's cousin, Theo, he's amazing. He, he's like, bro, what were you thinking? <laughs> he's like, dude, they're just gonna screenshot your, you know, or text himself, get your number, like with just how people think, you know? And so, uh, so he didn't get past the first row and he just snagged it and put it in his pocket. I thought it was going around, you know, like, revelation, <laughs> amazing, the wonders, you know? And, uh, but I thought it was funny because that was how many stitches I got in my leg. The 29. <laughs> Just fun prophetic stuff. But um, probably none of that happens to you. So, <laughs> But anyway, but watch this. Uh, the outer garment can speak of um, shame um, from sin that, that we often commit. And, and sometimes even that someone else may have committed against us. You know, these things the Lord is a master at removing as though it was not there. If I have time, I doubt I will. But there's so many verses in the word, like where he literally resets the soul. 
This is what he does. It's a lie of the enemy. It's a vulture. If you think that thing, well, I've been dealing with for so long, it's so real. It's there. The shame is there. I cannot shake it. The Lord can totally remove it as though it's not there. Even though you may remember the incident, it's like the, the sting of it's not there. You don't care. There's no shame attached to it. It's beautiful. I don't know how he does it. You know, it's kind of like I was thinking of like a simple analogy for just the ease of understanding. You know, if you have like a thermostat or something electronic, I don't know, but say a thermostat, the new digital ones, and say somehow the wires get crossed in the back to read accurately the temperature, the codes, whatever it may be. Say the wiring doesn't get done just right, and then it's going to start blinking up error, error. You guys know what I mean? Like digital things that do that. Well, when, when we deal with things in life where it hits the soul, often that's what can start to pop up. The wiring gets off. It's error, error, error. The Lord comes in in his blood, perfect sacrifice, and he just resets the wires. And there's, there's no error codes anymore. You don't understand. It's not even a part of your life. You don't understand. You know what I mean? And if anything, any memory from it is just a strength now to set other people free in the anointing. It's just beautiful how he does it. So um, the shame, not a chance. He never puts it on people, never even sees it. Even sins, he, he removes them as far as the east is to the west, the Bible says, the most loving father, the most perfect, like mind-blowing covenant we've ever been given. Just crazy what all he's done. Uh, guilt is another one. Sorry, I start thinking about just him. Uh, guilt. It just stays on us like a cloud. He, he can obliterate it. Uh, offense, you know, we get offended and things like this. It's not, not good. The Bible says don't be easily offended. Rejection. These are some of these things that cause you to, you carry them like the outer garment, but also you feel to cover up from shame and different things to swim. We, but we must swim to the Lord and he can remove it. Um, rejection, it could be us being rejected or sometimes us rejecting the Lord like Peter did, whatever it may be, uh, warped identity, words spoken, things like this. These are things that um, cause a soul to not be whole and, and cause us not to prosper in our soul. Look, some people, I'm telling you, you can walk in prospering in all things. Some people have that revelation, sowing and reaping and generosity, and they have it broke wide open. They know of God as their shepherd. They walk in abundance. My cup runneth over. They walk in healing. That revelation's real. They stay in divine health. But if they don't have this revelation of what the sacrifice has done in the soul, and then all of a sudden there's always insecurities. You guys know what I mean? There's always like somebody says just something the right way, and there's an offense there. There's something that pops up. And what the Lord is, if we'll swim to him and pop up, and in a second, I love you. They literally have breakfast with Jesus. We may go a little long if that's okay. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll try and tighten it up. But, and then he goes on a walk with him, and it was, he was forever changed in a moment. This is what the Lord does. Um, insecurities that come in many forms. They just happen in life and they're just not there. You'll get next to the Lord and you'll be like, man, I don't feel any of that. It's actually gone because it doesn't shame you. Insecure for what? You have me. Uh, you know what I mean? There's such security in him. There's no weeping bitterly because you're in there with the Lord. It's just incredible. Uh, emotional pain. You guys remember Isaiah 53 covers that too, emotional and physical, all pain. He took it on the cross. Um, so anyway, back here, though, it says, uh, they dr basically, I'll paraphrase, they drug the fish uh, to shore. Peter swam. <clears throat> and they get there, and uh, the Bible says that Jesus, oh, yeah, yeah, we have an image. This is the breakfast part. Hopefully we can put it up. I thought it was cool. Again, old and cheesy, but it gives us a visual. Isn't that awesome? So the Lord, he's over there. We can leave it up. I just like it, man. It's the Lord. And there's fishing involved <laughs> and eating. Anyway, um, someday the Lord's going to anoint like a new artist that's like, because all I have is the older, I can only find this older stuff. But so the, the Lord, though, I love this. It says he made breakfast for them, the Lord. Number one, my mind starts going on like he built the fire. I think like that was the most profound, perfect fire that the earth ever saw made. The Lord made it. He created the trees that even create the combustion to make fire, the earth, all of it. I just want, I start thinking like that. Like, did he lay them? Because I, I normally will build fires where I lay the logs. My dad taught me this. 
long ways to allow oxygen to suck through and build a good flame or did he do the TP, you know, how did the Lord build a fire? It's the most perfect fire you ever saw. He built the thing. He lit it. Then he makes breakfast. I love if you read in there, it says he actually put the fish on the fire, on the coals. Barbie on the half shell. <laughs> Ate it straight out of the fish, just raw. I'm, I just go into like seeing this. You're having breakfast with the Lord. He's resurrected. So in the Bible says, if you read closely, they all got there. And he says, look, bring, I love this. He goes, bring some of the fish y'all caught. I'm thinking they didn't catch nothing. You made the fish jump in their net. They, they, they like didn't do anything. But he's so kind and good, speaking to broken souls that are about to abandon and go back to the old chapter. He's so good. Bring some of the fish y'all caught. He's so affirming. Like, you did good, boys. He's like, y'all, horrible. Bass Pro Tournament losers. <laughs> all night long, didn't catch a thing. Tried all your fancy baits. But when I step on this thing, you can do no thing apart from me. But he's also so good. Bring some of the fish y'all caught. We'll, we'll throw those in there too. He's so good. And you can imagine him sitting there eating. Uh, Sheesh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, you can Im imagine him, uh, you know, sitting there and, um, I mean, he, he's resurrected, you know what I mean? There's, uh, there's holes in his hands. I mean, he's, he's, there, he's picking up. You can see the fish through his hand, the bread. How you doing, boys? Miss you, love you. You're going to do good. It, it says that they, uh, they um, didn't, they feared to ask him because they knew it was him. That it, I feel like it was super quiet other than the Lord talking and he's eating. Proud of you boys. You're going to do good. I'm telling him to build my church through you. Greater things you'll do than me. He's just sitting there just speaking life over him, restoring him. And, uh, he does this, but we got to swim to him. Look, I don't care the shame, whatever it is, the, the outer garment you carry, who cares? If you knew all of our backstories, we were all like, oh my gosh, we're all like horrific. You know what I mean? We need the, our garments are, are horrible. All beauty is found in him. We've got to uh, jump, plunge into the sea and swim to him, pop up in the new mercy of, of the morning and uh, he'll feed you. Listen, listen, the Bible says he served them even built the fire, cooked the fish. It says he gave him bread first, which is a picture of himself, and then fish. He's literally serving them, feeding them. And uh, and I love in verse 11, it says, uh, no, I'm sorry, verse uh, 15. Watch this. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, I love this too with the Lord. He knows the human makeup, the body, anatomy, whatever. He waits and feeds them first. He knows like they hadn't eaten all night. Let me make sure physically they're stable. I don't need to talk to Peter when he's emotionally all over the place. Get some protein in him, some bread. I don't even if you just can hear better when you eat same. You're like, man, I just got to get something to eat so I can think straight. So it says, and when they had eaten breakfast, can you imagine, man, the most perfect fire ever is crackling, popping at the exact perfect time. Jesus made it. Cooked the fish to perfection. Bread from the Lord. He's eating it, holes in his hands, just, just affirming them, washing them in the water of him. He is the word. And, uh, and then it says, when they had eaten breakfast, he said to Simon Peter, he was doing so much here. Reset, re course correcting all of them. But then he really had to go to the heart of it of Peter because of the denial thing. And he knew he's about to two chapters later build his church on him in Acts 2. And uh, so he says, um, he says, Simon, son of Jonah. This is really key. And we all know this passage. He addresses him three times. First time, do you love me more than these? First time he had to say, do you love me more than? You know, this is super key. He, he does, he's okay if you love things in life, but if you love anything more than him, you've got a problem. That's a big, big problem. If you love even family more than me, you're not worthy of the kingdom. He says that. If you love mothers and brothers more than me, you're not worthy of the kingdom. Um, 
And but he says, so first he had to set that in place. Do you love me more than these? I believe he could speak of his camaraderie with his friends, the fish even that you catch, your, your world. Because I see you going back to it now, but I've got to reset your soul and course correct your whole thing here. And it's, it's very calculated that he's, this time he says, Simon, son of Jonah. Th- because his dad was a fisherman. He's talking to him from the old chapter he's trying to go back to. He's like, look, basically saying, hey, fisherman, that's not who you are. Remember, I called you out of that. Simon, this is the only other time he says, Simon, son of Jonah. He doesn't call him Peter all three times because he's speaking to him. He's got to get him out of that old identity he's trying to go back to. Does that make sense? Uh, The only other time he says that is when um, he says, who do people say that I am? You know, I think it's Mark 16 or somewhere in there. Uh, And Peter says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. He goes, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood hadn't revealed that to you. Now you'll be called Peter. Upon you I'll build my church because that was the identity shift. He'd already called him out of that. But when the soul comes out of lack of being whole and schisms happen and voids happen through life and we're in interim stages of God's calling old chapter to the new, if we don't choose right and we go back to it, he's got to do it again. And so that's what he's doing. Simon, son of Jonah, basically, hey, fisherman, you think you're something. How would that go for you all night long? Caught nothing. Do you love me more than these, your world, what you know, what makes you feel like you're somebody? He said, Lord, you know I love you. He says a second time, uh, Simon, son of Jonah. I just start thinking of the Lord, sorry. And uh, you know I love you. Third time, Simon, uh, son of Jonah, do you love me? And it, it says Peter was uh, pained, actually grieved, because he asked him three times. And what he's doing is he's getting somewhere. And every time he says, do you love me? The first time, this is super key. All of it's like so huge. Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He says, you know, I love you. Um, feed my lambs. That's a baby sheep, right? We all know the passage. Feed my lambs. Meaning he's talking shepherd talk now. When he first called him, remember, he knew his identity he was so wrapped in, into it. He called him out and said, I'll make you fishers of men. He's still talking fisher talk with him. But you've been with three years now. You know, I, I commissioned you, actually sent you out in the Great Commission. I'm not even talking your language anymore. I'm talking, hey, fisherman, I need you to be a shepherd. It's a total chapter flip. It's a total different jump in your call. And this is what he'll do to get us out of the old. Uh, do you love me more than these? Yes, you know, I love you. I need to feed my lambs. Because it's one thing to fish which he did well at, and even fish for men, the evangelistic work. But when you start doing the shepherd role, a whole other ballgame. It's death to self. Anybody can catch fish and, and pull them in, but sheep you've got to stay with for the long haul. You've got to lay your life down for them. You've got to do what the Lord does, become him. It's his sheep. And so he's, he's, what he's doing is reverting, reversing and, and recorrecting his soul, resetting it, course correcting, and sealing him for the eternal purpose. And if we'll just swim to the Lord... Get near him, have breakfast with him. I see the whole Revelation 3.20 here where he says, look, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's on the shore knocking. If you hear my voice and let me come in, he swims to him, I'll dine with you. And they have breakfast. And then I'll, you will, I'll grant with you to sit with me on my throne. And then there's identity again, sitting with him. The calling sets in, the authority comes back. And so it's that whole thing. But he says, um, feed my lambs. Do you love me? You know I love you, Lord. Tend to my sheep, he says this time. That word means shepherd, govern, guide, lead. And they're not lambs anymore, they're sheep. There's a growth there. Jesus is speaking like over his entire calling right now in this one dialogue. He's sealing him up to the martyrdom, to the end, in this one dialogue. One dialogue with the Lord can flip our world upside down. Reset the soul in a moment, seal you for your eternal call. That's what he did to Abram. He said, oh yeah, He, he literally spoke to him in the now, to the point of his death, his whole call was sealed through the, through the crucifixion, what all the Lord has done. You remember, he says, Abram, this, that, and the other, the smoking pot came. He says, you'll die at a good old age. Your descendants will go through a years of bondage, but they'll plunder, and this, that, and that. He seals them to the end. He does this with Peter. So uh, feed my lambs, tend to my sheep, which is govern, shepherd, guide, lead. Do you love me the last time? And he says, feed my sheep again, but sheep, meaning lambs to sheep. 
And then as they grow even older, keep feeding them, tending, governing. And just so you know, you, you don't get to call the shots anymore. You can't just jump in the boat wherever you want, fish, make some money, come and go, fish. You don't tend to. You just catch them. Once you catch them, that is what it is. No sheep, it's, it's not a glamorous job, the, the job of a shepherd. So I love that about the Lord too. He resets your soul, but he'll tell you the cost and seal you by the grace to do it. And, and on this last dialogue, watch this, and I'll start to land it. He says on this last one, feed my sheep, verse 17. If you get down to the end of verse 17, he says, feed my sheep and watch as he continues in the verse 18. Uh, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So the way, simply put, the Lord resets our soul is, is he, we've got to come to him. All your shame, whatever, he doesn't care. My gosh, he's, he's dealt with all of humanity for all of time. He knew it before the beginning. That's what's so freeing about Abram. In the sacrifice was his mistakes before he started. Again, do, do we condone loose living? Never. But again, you make mistakes, you get hurt, things happen. We come to the Lord and what he's going to do is feed you, commune with you, care for you, never shame you, guilt you. You, you come in deeper and he resets by reminding your love for him. Do you love me? Love me and follow me. Love me, follow me. And, and that's, um, sorry. That's what resets our love for him, our focus on what he's fully done and the constant following. But in it, he tells you the cost and he's like, look, I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a long haul. This is big. Interim stage are not popular, glamorous or not. Shepherds, listen, they often end up on the backside of nowhere. Nobody sees what they're doing. They don't get a pat on the back. Sheep bite them. They headbutt them. I love that about sheep. You know, they, they do this and they're wham. If, they're, if they feel threatened, they just butt you with their heads. You know, they're very disobedient. They constantly get off the path and go the wrong way. And you got to tell them over and over and over and over and over and over, and over you know, again. To get, no, come back and hurt and tend and shepherd and govern. But what he's doing, when the Lord speaks to you, though, he, his voice and presence is so powerful and glorious and beautiful, it just seals you. You don't care what the MO is. You don't care what the job is. It's him. It's so beautiful and all together. Give me the rod. Give me the sheep. They can butt me all day long if I'm in your will. I don't care for the long haul because then you see the Lord says, he, he says not if or it's not prophetic anymore. It's, it's, it's a done deal, meaning you will. This is how you will live and you will go here and you will die a death, which record shows Peter was crucified upside down. He didn't feel worthy to be crucified upright like his Lord and King. Martyr's death to the end. He's like, give me the rod. Fisherman, no, I'm never going back. And this is what the Lord does when we have a run in with him. We dine with him and focus on him, love him. He's just going to constantly keep telling you, like, yeah, I get the mistakes, whatever. You got your outer garment, cool. You didn't bring it, I don't care. Love me, look at me, follow me. Tend to my sheep, because you, you can't love him well if you don't follow. So there's a cost too, and so they both go one and the same, and just we stay the course and love him, and the things just fall off. You stay in his presence. Just love him. But so-and-so do this. That's fine. You, you're done. You're done over your temper, temper tantrum. Who hurts you? I understand. I was hurt. You rejected me way worse than they did, but he won't even do that. He just tells you how amazing you are. While well, he's got high standards, but he'll say, love me, look at me focus on me. I'll never forget. I learned, um, and I'll land it here, but we, I was at the end of a 40 day fast once. Some of you heard this account and it took me a minute. Judah, actually, my son it was years ago. I was on the 38th day, really going after heaven to set the other. And so I'm on the 38th day. It's just all in the Lord. Some of our warfare tactics and we give the enemy too much credit. We give people that have hurt us and our soulless wounds that seem real and they are but they're not as real as him. They're not as powerful as him. Loving him and following him is the most powerful two train tracks you can get on. As soon as you get on those, everything changes. You'll be a shepherd to the day you die and hang upside down worthy for it. And, uh, and so, but I, I remember uh, I was uh, working outside 38th the day, Zoe came and got me. She goes, she's like, Papa, something's going on with Judah. And um, we don't talk about it a lot. I just don't like giving the enemy any highlight reels. He doesn't get any. Jesus does. 
And she goes, something, Judas, I don't, I, you know, whatever. So I come in there, enemy cheap shotted, you know, uh, he went around me and went at the children on, on the, a deep fast. And so Judah went into a vision. He, both of them are real prophetic, but I didn't know what was happening. This is my first time I'd seen it several times since. Uh, my mom's seen him in one before he was in a vision. I was out of the country. And, um, but it was these four like demonic figures on a, like in his room, you know, trying to attack and just th- bring fear. And so I go into his room and I'm seeing a blank sheetrock wall. And he's looking like freaked out, but he's in both worlds. He can see me and talk to me, but he sees these four demons. And so he's like flipping out. And, um, I got to tell you this. Can I say w- one more story? This is just cool. This is a cool one. And I'll finish this one. Uh, listen to this. This happened. My parents will remember this. Sorry if you celebrate Halloween, just it's not God. So <laughs> just, just want to, may want to re-pray about that one. Listen to this though. This, we didn't know any better. You know, coming up, my parents were, were lost at a young age, of course. They got born again, thank the Lord. And we, we got uh, saved later, but they were amazing and, and newer and some of the stuff. So we didn't know Halloween was bad. We're just thinking buckets of candy. Yes, Lord. <laughs> not Lord, but you know what I mean? You're thinking buckets of candy. So I don't know what our outfits were that year. Me and my brother went around the neighborhood getting candy, came back, struck gold, Tootsie Rolls and whatever. So, so my brother, I forget what his outfit was. He had a mask though. This is crazy. That night, you, you, you remember this, my, yeah. He, oh, I forget what his mask was. Something demonic. Halloween, I'm just going to say it straight. It's totally demonic. Don't do anything having anything to do with it. You know, if you want to figure out a cliche way to use it to outreach, go for it. But it's just not God. So, um, uh, so the middle of the night, my brother will tell you this, these three angels came through the wall of his room. One kind of smaller, they're all different sizes, three. Freaked him out, Go, f- kind of floating through the air, come through the wall, start floating around his room, looking around, and they come by the by, uh, the bedside where the Halloween mask is and crunched it in, stepped it in. Leave through the wall. He was so paranoid, didn't want to get out of bed. He waited till the morning and told my parents and freaked out. The mask the next morning was still crunched in. Isn't that crazy? I love that. Had nothing to do with the message, but, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so, but I remember, so I get Judah. Oh no, I, I'm thinking all like me natural, but everything's in him. Everything's at, even your highest vantage point in warfare is looking at him, worshiping the Lord. The enemy hates that you go higher than the snake line on the mountain and he can't go there. You just like, Oh, you little like annoying sparrows. Let me just get on wings of eagles and just soar to where you can't go this high in glory. You just worship Jesus. So the enemy, he may be yakking, talking, manifest. That's, man, make a lot of noise, my friend. But look at him. Look at him with me as long as you can. Isn't he glorious? Look at his eyes burning, full of fire. Look at the holes in his hands. And the enemy just starts to screech. They can't hang around glory. Your highest vantage point. That's what I love about, like, Worshippers that Levites, they're on the front line. That's what you, you know, so, but I'm, I'm new. So I'm like, oh yeah, I finally figure out there's like demons. And I go, how, how big are they? And he's like, oh, he's just trying to talk to me. You know, he's young. Now he's like, he's got this side to him that's, you don't cross him in the spirit. Just saying, super humble and all, but he don't play. Uh, but young, you don't know what's going on. And, and I said, how tall are they? I said, one, one of my angels I've seen before is nine feet tall. How, how tall are they? I'm trying to, I'm thinking natural. You swing left, I swing right. I'm thinking like this. That's not how you do it. So I said, all right, watch this. I'm, they're lying to you, son. They're liars. Why? I said, watch this. So I could see where he was fixated. So I step into him. I said, see this? I go right into him. He goes, oh, he freaked out all the more because the two worlds mixed. I was like, that was dumb. I was like, man, note to self, don't do that again. <laughs> so I'm trying stuff in the natural. Finally, I grab him. It's probably the Holy Spirit. Finally, and I go, man, let's worship Jesus. We begin to look at the Lord. And from his world, there's been two now. Uh, it's wild. Somehow it's the Lord will come into it and obliterate the dark realm. Um, it's when they just try and take cheap shots the more extended fast and stuff. You see where the enemy came at Jesus in the 40 day. And, uh, but it, my point was looking at him is what does it. Looking at him resets the soul, obeying him, following him. And you don't have to get now. Are, is there forgiveness and things? Oh yeah. We teach on that too. Or some of our main pillars, we go through it, we work through it with people. There's, there's forgiveness, getting the truth that sets free. All this is very vital. I just meant in life. Sometimes you know people aren't believers. They hurt you, and they don't care, and they're never going to repent. 
they, they think they're right till, you know, till the end of the world. And you can't carry that in you. And so it's, it's going to the Lord. So, um, but so good. You guys want to stand? And if the worship team could help me, please. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, and if our uh, prayer team could come, love to pray and just have the Lord set people free or fill you afresh, many, many things. Dina, did the Mets win? I saw y'all went to the game. They didn't? Oh, okay. It's kind of a win-win because we're in a... Did, when was your birthday? Yesterday? 18th. No way. 18th, Dina. Right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dina. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. We love Dina, most amazing, God-fearing woman on the earth, so humble, precious, one of our students. But yeah, I saw that, so it was a good game, though. It was a good game. It was good. Uh, that's awesome. Fun. <laughs> Get some uh, hot dogs or nachos or something? Nachos. Nachos, come on, wise choice. <laughs> they got to go to, uh, for her birthday, I saw the Mets and Braves game, so good. So let's just focus on the Lord. And... Uh, see what he would do. Jesus, thank you for your presence and your word. We love you. Thank you that you're so precious, true, pure. And uh, we say be glorified this morning in our lives. I pray you come in like a mighty river and uh, reset the soul. Do a supernatural work in each and everyone's lives. I pray we leave different this morning that those scabs, I'm even like sensing like the, from old wounds would fall off. There'd be brand new skin. It would be whole in our soul because of what you have done. You are exceedingly great reward. I pray you'd heal bodies, even um, across the world online watching. Come Holy Spirit, touch your people, I pray. Reset the soul of your bride in this hour. Make us whole in you. Let us fall more in love with you. You are altogether lovely. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'd love to invite you to come if you want prayer for anything. It could be any reason. Our amazing prayer team's up here full of the Holy Spirit. We'd love to just bring, bring life. You can come. Come now.
make my soul alive. You put your love inside. I'm singing out your lovely name. I'm giving you everything. You make my soul alive. You put your love inside. There's nothing left.
Thank you, Jesus. Just continue to focus on the Lord. God, you're so good, so perfect. There's no one like you. Romans says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. God, as Brian has spoke these past couple of weeks on the renewal of the mind, just going deep in your word, I just, I pray that everybody that is touched by this has a fresh revelation of what that means to renew your mind, the different facets of it. God, I pray that the things of this world grow strangely dim. I, I pray that that your world, your spirit world, your spirit realm become more real than what we see around us. That we are renewed in the image of your world. That what we, what we feel is what you feel. What we sense is what you sense. That we're in this world, but not of it. And that from that place that we can, we can walk fully in the promises that you intend for our lives solely to glorify your name, to bring your kingdom here. God, we thank you for the gift. We thank you for all of the teachings, the revelation, your word, your perfect word. And more than anything, we thank you for the the perfect sacrifice of your son. Because through him is the only way that we can come to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.